Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining. My name is Tanya Behel, and I'm one of the project managers for the Cancer Institute. Welcome, and thank you for attending our Ahead of, lecture, Ahead of Cancer lecture series this evening, sponsored by the Allegheny Health Network Cancer Institute. There are a few housekeeping items that we want to review before we start. During the presentation, all participants can type questions into the chat or Q&A portion of the Zoom. We will be addressing those questions at the end of the lecture, if time allows. Participants are not able to speak during the conference, but again, we encourage feedback via the chat option. Tonight, we are excited to welcome Dr. Jean Finley, who will be speaking about activating the immune system to fight cancer. Dr. Jean Finley is a graduate of the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, where he also completed his internship and residency in medicine, and participated in the Physician Investigator Training Program in Molecular Bio-Oncology. After completing a medical oncology fellowship at the Pittsburgh Cancer Institute, Dr. Finley began to practice medical oncology at Pittsburgh Teaching Hospitals and Community Hospitals in Western Pennsylvania, and now practices at Armstrong County Memorial Hospital in Kidanning and Allegheny General Hospital in Pittsburgh. He is board certified in internal medicine and in medical oncology. Dr. Finley has more than 30 years of experience in clinical practice and research. He has conducted grant-funded research in oncogenes and various other topics in cancer and has numerous medical scientific publications to his credit. He has served as an instructor for physicians in training and on cancer advisory boards. Dr. Finley is a member of several medical societies, including the American Society for Clinical Oncology and the American Association for Cancer Research. Welcome, Dr. Finley. Thank you, Tanya. So anyway, tonight, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> immunotherapy. And as you see from the this first slide that I'm, uh, my specialty really is in lung and pleural-based tumors, but uh, I'm practicing a lot of general oncology and hematology in the community. So I have uh, a lot of experience with cancer. So we're going to try to focus down a little bit on lung and pleural uh, disease, but we're going to sort of start with a kind of a broad overview. So um, you'll have to bear with me. And uh, if you can use the chat or some other mechanism, if you have a, a question, we can probably, uh, uh, you know, get uh, get to it uh, during the talk or more likely at the end where we will have a QA. and a So just a few definitions, you know, what is cancer? Cancer is a disease of the human body in which your normal cells become um, mutated and have the ability to grow in an uncontrolled fashion. They can spread to other parts of the body and different tissues produce different kinds of cancers. And so cancer is not one disease, but many diseases. And there's more than a hundred different kinds of cancer. And so this, uh, one size fits all approach has not been successful, but we have been very successful in looking at individual cancers and to hone down on uh, different aspects of it that allow us to fight it and to cure it in many cases. This is just the numbers to show the different types of cancer and how frequent they are. In men, prostate cancer is the most common in women, breast cancer. And number two cancer in both sexes is uh, lung cancer, which is about 12 or 13% of uh, cancers in each sex. And overall, about a quarter of all cancers in the United States and moreover worldwide are lung cancers. But the problem with lung cancer is that while it only is number two on the list, it is actually number one in terms of death. And as you could see here, uh, there's about uh, 120,000 deaths related to lung cancer every year in the U.S., which is a, an extraordinary number uh, compared to some of the other uh, malignancies that you see here. The risk factors for lung cancer um, and cancer in general include mainly smoking and tobacco use, but also obesity and poor diet, lack of exercise, and different cancers are more prone to occur in people who are sedentary, such as colon cancers and lymphomas, 
Uh, people who smoke and drink tend to get lung cancer, esophageal cancer, cancers of the stomach. And radiation exposure or sun exposure can also cause cancer, particularly skin cancers like melanoma or in the case of people exposed to radiation such as Hiroshima survivors or people at, uh, who had involved in nuclear accidents, they can get leukemias or lymphomas. So this can be uh, very problematic. So these are just general rules. Also, the other thing I wanted to point out is that age makes a difference. So the older you are, the more likely it is that you have cancer. It's unusual for children to get cancer, but they certainly can. So we like to just be aware of these things. And a lot of health promoting activities can also reduce cancer risk. So this is uh, just a slide to show you how many different cancers can be associated with being overweight or obese. And there are quite a few here of different organ types. And I just uh, not to mention it, but you know, um, lung cancer is not listed here, but other cancers related to that esophageal cancer, which also occurs in the chest, is also more frequent in people who are overweight or obese. So the next slide just shows some famous people that have had cancer. And I can remember as a child, when a young, uh, young person, when John Wayne got lung cancer and he had a, um, his lung removed and unfortunately the cancer came back and he succumbed. And we have a picture here of uh, Steve McQueen who had an unusual type of thoracic cancer called mesothelioma where the <clears throat> cancer occurs on the lining of the lung. And then uh, Julia Dreyfus had breast cancer. And there are many, many uh, cancers, cuts across all socioeconomic patterns and uh, <clears throat> attacks the rich and it attacks the poor as well. So it's a, a very, very significant health burden, both in the United States and worldwide. So <clears throat> just to kind of outline where, where you would go if you take a loved one to the doctor uh, where there's a suspected cancer. Excuse me. Usually you have to detect it somehow. So the patient comes with a complaint. The doctor may do a physical examination. He may perform blood tests and x-rays. And ultimately, if there's a suspicion that a cancer exists, they'll do a biopsy. And following the biopsy, we try to stage the cancer because staging is extremely important in defining the best way to treat the cancer. Uh, ultimately, treatments can include surgery if the cancer is localized, <coughs> excuse me, or if the cancer is uh, more advanced, <coughs> things like radiation or ultimately chemotherapy or immunotherapy or certain targeted therapies and all of these are done with a hope of cure or long-term survival, and which we've been highly successful at over the years. And we have improved the cure rates for patients with cancer significantly during the course of my career. So breast cancer, the most common screening test that we do is mammography. Not a perfect test, but the best one we have. And it can detect very small cancers in the breast and usually these are recommended for older women, women over the age of 40. Uh, but mammography has its own controversies because many of the things we do find on a mammogram may not be cancer. So none of our screening tests are perfect, but the goal is to find cancers early when they're the most curable state possible. Prostate cancer, we use digital rectal exam. But we also have a test called PSA that we can use for screening. We're not going to belabor this, but I do want to move a little bit into screening of lung cancer, mainly because that's one of my interests. And lung cancer screening, as opposed to, say, colon cancer screening or breast cancer screening, where we screen the entire general population, as you know, uh, most lung cancers occur in people who smoke cigarettes. About 80% of lung cancers occur in cigarette smokers. So we'd like to screen those people who are at higher risk of lung cancer, and those are the smoking population <clears throat> and the older population. 
So lung cancer is the second most common cancer. It's a leading cause of cancer death, both in the U.S. and in uh, the world. And in fact, lung cancer kills more people than colon cancer, breast cancer, and prostate cancer combined. So it's a quite lethal cancer. So we know also that when the cancer is advanced, it can't be cured surgically, although we are going to talk about, as I mentioned in the title, the immune system and how we're using that now in lung cancer, which is really a, a big advance uh, during my career and it's been uh, very, very satisfying. But if they find it early, uh, you can do better. So we do like to screen patients who are smokers and are at risk for lung cancer. And the over the last 10 years, CT scanning has come into its own as a screening tool for lung cancer. Um, years ago, when I was uh, early in the field, we used to use uh, chest x-rays, and it was a very imperfect test, never really shown to reduce death rates from your lung cancer. And so now, however, the number of uh, studies have been done demonstrating the benefits of low-dose CT scanning to detect lung cancers at the earliest stage when it's the most curable. Here's a uh, a very important study that was done in the United States called the Lung Cancer Screening Trial. And this was conducted in thousands of patients uh, throughout the U.S. And these are the graphs on the right side demonstrating the reduction in um, the number of lung cancers and, more importantly, the death from lung cancer, which is in the bottom, the, with the use of low-dose CAT scans, this curve here shows that the patients are doing better if they had the low-dose CT scan as opposed to the chest X-ray. And overall, in that study, it showed that about 20% decrease in the death rate from lung cancer which is an extraordinary number for a disease that kills about 120,000 Americans every year. So who should have a low-dose CT? These are older people who smoke, who have smoked a good amount of cigarettes. Um, and we use a measure to decide how much tobacco you have consumed over the course of your lifetime. And that's called the pack year. So if you smoke a pack of cigarettes uh, every day for a year, that's called one pack year. And if you do that for 20 years, you have a 20 pack year smoking history. And that's a significant risk factor for lung cancer. And there are many studies that show the more you smoke and the more number of years you smoke, then you elevate your risk even more. So people who are 50 to 80, people who are current smokers and people who've had at least a 20-pack year smoking history are often recommended to have an annual low-dose CT to detect lung cancer. But unfortunately, very few people in the United States who are eligible for lung cancer screening get it. So you can see here on the left side of this slide that only six in 100 patients in the United States receive low-dose CTs as a screening test. And in some areas of the country, it's even less, down to 1%. So if you are a smoker, you should ask your primary care physician uh, if a low-dose CT scan would be something that could be helpful for you. Again, the smoking risk of lung cancer is highlighted here, and it mentions also secondhand smoke. But I put this slide up really to focus on this issue of radon. Because, um, you know, in the United States, there is, and especially in Western Pennsylvania, there are a lot of coal veins running through Pennsylvania, and many of us live over coal mines. And many of us have basements. And radon is a a uh, byproduct or a 
uh, a gas that's produced in um, coal mines and in other kinds of mining activities, and it tends to be heavier than air and accumulate in your basement. So if you haven't had a radon test in your house, I think it's worth doing. There are very cheap ones that you can buy. And if you do have a lot of radon in your home, it's very easy to ventilate your home and it's not an expensive proposition. <clears throat> Other things like asbestos will increase your risk. I mentioned Steve McQueen and mesothelioma, but it's also a risk factor for more common kinds of lung cancer. And the family history. We certainly have seen patients where uh, lung cancers run in the family and other kinds of cancers, but we haven't really figured out what genes are, are producing this elevated risk. So enough about that. So we'll move on a little bit and start talking about some of these other aspects. Once you have a diagnosis of lung cancer, what type of lung cancer is it? Because that's very important in deciding who, how you should be treated. So you see here a little pie chart that shows on the left side of it, the small cell lung cancer here, which is an unusually fast growing lung cancer. <clears throat> and it's a relatively small minority of all lung cancers accounting for only about 15%. The vast majority of lung cancers are what we call non-small cell lung cancer. And these include adenocarcinoma, and uh, squamous cancers, the vast majority of them, 40% of the non-small cells at least are uh, adenocarcinomas. And then you have less of these so-called squamous or large cell cancers. And this is important because we treat non-small cell lung cancer differently than we treat small cell lung cancer. And that's why it's important to know these. So the other thing, that's very critical in deciding how to treat cancer is staging. So we like to know what the stage is of the patient. So what the heck does stage mean? Stage is just a way of saying how much cancer there is and where it is. So for example, on the left of this, of this slide, you can see that stage one are relatively small cancers, less than three centimeters. And they're usually just confined to one area. They are confined to one area of the lung, in this case, on the right lung. Well, here it's on the left side, but this is, in fact, the right lung. In any event, the stage two cancers are larger and often have spread to lymph nodes within the lung. Stage three cancers are characterized by larger tumors and tumors that involve the lymph nodes in the center part of the chest or the mediastinum. And the most advanced stage of lung cancer is stage four, where you have tumor in the lung and then it's spread through blood or the lymph system to other organs like the liver or the bones. And so this is, these are the main stages of cancer and really this applies to all different cancers. So. I think this is something you do need to be aware of. So how do we treat uh, non-small cell lung cancer? So the traditional treatments for this disease include surgery, radiation, and drug therapy. And we're gonna include uh, some, some words about drug therapy in specific and immunotherapy and the modern immune therapies uh, is what we're gonna spend uh, some time on because I think this is the sort of the uh, vanguard of where things are moving now. And we have to be aware of this uh, as both a patient or a caregiver or even a clinician. So you have a sense of what's going on. So I wanna focus on this non-small cell lung cancer entity. And I wanna focus on advanced stage disease here. And the reason for that is First of all, I'm interested in lung cancer. Second of all, about <clears throat> two thirds of all lung cancers occur uh, at and present to the doctor at advanced stage. And that's shown here on the right side of this uh, slide. And on the left side, it's just a rough graph from quite some time ago of the survival rate of lung cancer, just showing that your survival is much better when the graph 
here is much higher if you have stage one lung cancer than you have stage four. And the way to read this graph is on the, what we call the y-axis. These are the percentage of patients surviving. And on the x-axis are the time from diagnosis from zero out to five years. So you can see, for example, in stage one can lung cancer, somewhere around 60% of people are alive at five years. And it's actually higher than that now. This is an older graph. And the five-year survival for lung cancer is quite low on the order of 5%. But this is a traditional older graph, and we're making a lot of progress, as you'll see. And I have a few slides about that later. So we're going to shift gears now and talk a little bit about treatment. And this is sort of a timeline of uh, lung cancer advances, which have occurred uh, over the years. And I don't really mean for you to memorize this, but you can see on the right side of this, the survival or the median or the average survival has generally increased over time with the use of immune therapies and targeted therapies, which are another uh, whole uh, avenue of treatment that we have available in lung cancer. And we're not going to talk about these today because uh, we can save that for another time. So the treatment of lung cancer has certainly evolved a lot. Uh, and when I started in my career, we didn't really treat lung cancer, advanced lung cancers very much because the survival was so poor and the chemotherapy treatments we had, although they had effectiveness, they were quite toxic. And we didn't have a good way to control the symptoms related to chemotherapy. Uh, so it made it difficult on the patients. Uh, and as we go through time, we discovered targeted therapies in 2004, which are pills which attack genetic changes in cancer, which is a very appealing way to treat it. And then more recently, immune therapies unexpectedly have become one of the mainstays of treatment of advanced lung cancer and has been a very gratifying uh, development because the therapies are generally much less toxic and much more effective than chemotherapy. So just an old slide to show you one of the seminal uh, studies that was done in lung cancer and this was published by uh, some leading lung cancer experts in the early 2000s. And I just don't want to draw your attention to any of the specific thing, except to look at this median survival curve, right, or line here, where you see this number seven or eight months. This is telling you that the use of these two chemotherapy drugs is only achieving a survival of about eight months. Not very good if you're a person with stage four lung cancer. And this in fact was the state of the art in the early 2000s. So uh, things have changed a great deal and uh, much for the better. So we'll just fast forward now to a more modern clinical trial, uh, looking at a similar population of patients with advanced lung cancer. And this graph is showing you um, a percent of people who survived where 100% would be a perfectly flat line that went across horizontally <clears throat> and a 0% where the graph is down here. And on the x-axis of the graph, you see that this is time zero. And as time goes on, people who have cancer and get treated, they the graph goes down because some of these people do not survive. So this was a very, very important study, a seminal paper in lung cancer, showing that in the lower graph, the use of chemotherapy alone is in the red. And in the blue is where the addition of immunotherapy to the chemotherapy was done. And you can see there's a great separation of this curve and moreover, there's a flattening of this curve so that the patient's who received pembrolizumab, which is immunotherapy with their chemo, did much better. So in fact, at about two years, about 60 or 70% of people are alive here who were received the immunotherapy, where only about 40% of people are alive here 
uh, who did not. And this next slide is a um, and sort of uh, the last uh, publication on this study. And I think this is instructive because when we look at this median or the average survival of patients who receive these treatments with stage four lung cancer, and if you recall back a few slides, I showed you the survival was eight months. The survival here, even with chemotherapy alone, is about 10 months. So we've been able to administer chemotherapy more successfully to people. But the uh, striking thing here is you will achieve nearly two years of survival if you get the immunotherapy with the chemotherapy, and that's this blue curve. And you see how it flattens out very nicely. So whilst when I started out, only about 5% of people were alive at this 60 month mark or this five year mark. Now we're talking about 20 or more percent of people who are still alive at five years with lung cancer. And this is an extraordinary result. <clears throat> so this is just a summary to show you what I just told you. And having 20% of people alive at five years with lung cancer was something that we would could only dream of uh, earlier in the course of my career. So I'm gonna shift gears and spend a little time to talk about immune therapies, which are uh, really uh, the vanguard of the new way we're treating cancer. So, but this has an old history. It's not just happened in the last 15 to 20 years, but in fact, in papyruses discovered in the North African desert, there was a physician in Egypt named Imhotep, and he was not the mummy, but he was a doctor, and he tried to infect tumors to cause the tumors to be regressed and to simplify his surgical technique in removing them, and this was around 2600 BC, and there are many people in between this, but the from the U.S. standpoint, probably the most famous doctor who introduced the concept of immune therapy was uh, Dr. Kali, who was one of the surgeons at Memorial Hospital at its founding. And this is a New York Times article in 1908 describing his work using uh, bacterial extracts from streptococcus and staphylococcus to cure cancer. And in fact, Dr. Kali got into this because one of his patients with a tumor of the neck region got an infection after the surgery and his surgery was incomplete and Dr. Kali knew that, but yet the patient recovered and the cancer never came back. So he became fascinated with the use of bacteria as a way of treating cancer. And the drug that he developed called Kali's toxin was actually on the U.S. pharmacopoeia between 1900 and 1960, although it sort of fell out of use, but it was really the first immunotherapy uh, that was used to treat cancer in the modern era. But <clears throat> immunotherapy has advanced a lot since then. And probably the biggest proponent and champion of this was a guy named uh, Steve Rosenberg, who's shown on the cover of Newsweek in 1985. <clears throat> and he was experimenting with proteins made by your cells that stimulate or signal the immune system, including a drug called interleukin-2 and interferon alpha. And later, Dr. Rosenberg was a champion of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, which are white blood cells that can kill cancer, which infiltrate your tumors, but have problems attacking the tumor for a variety of reasons. And we'll get to some of those. Um, he's uh, quite a well-known guy. He's a number, number of uh, uh, scientific awards and achievements. And really, we have to hand it to him because he's been uh, spent his entire career in this field and um, really was the father of modern immunotherapy. Um, this 
are a couple of slides to show some of the dramatic responses that uh, led to uh, the use of this drug called IL-2 or interleukin-2 in cancer treatment in the 1980s, <laughs> leading, excuse me, leading to um, Dr. Rosenberg being on the cover of Newsweek, which I showed you at that time. Anyway, here's a patient who had a malignant melanoma, and this is a CAT scan showing the liver, and this large dark area in the liver is in fact cancer in this patient's liver. After treatment with IL-2, the cancer completely disappeared and this particular patient remained alive 20 years later. And in a similar vein, patients with advanced kidney cancer treated with interleukin-2 can achieve these remissions. All these dark areas on the left side of this panel show cancer in the liver. And you can see that it's completely disappeared here on the right with a normal looking liver scan. And again, this patient has been alive more than a decade. So these kinds of responses were extremely exciting and led to a lot of interest in this area. And in fact, we tried using these drugs in a number of different human solid tumors, but it wasn't very successful. And more recently, uh, we're still using inter interleukin-2 uh, now, but we have sort of moved away from this approach because of the some of the toxicities associated with it into more modern immunotherapies. And here are pictured two guys. One is named Dr. Allison on the left and Dr. Hancho from Japan on the right. And they shared the Nobel Prize three years ago for the development of modern immune therapies, which we call <laughs> immune checkpoint inhibitors. So the next slide, I'm gonna to try to show you a little uh, video, which I hope will come up because I think it's quite instructive and helpful. I might have to uh, drag this over. And if I get lucky, it'll be here. Okay, there we go. Immunotherapy is an exciting area of cancer research that is changing the way we think about cancer treatment. Immunotherapy works by using the body's immune system to fight cancer. The immune system is a complex network of organs, tissues, and cells, and the substances they make. Immunotherapy uses different ways to boost the immune system to do a better job of killing cancer cells. This video describes one type of immunotherapy that uses immune checkpoint inhibitors to treat cancer. T cells are a type of immune cell and are powerful weapons the immune system uses to fight cancer. Immune checkpoints on cell surfaces help control an immune response. Usually, immune checkpoints keep T cells inactive that is in an off state, until they're needed. This keeps the T cells from harming normal cells. Cancer cells can take advantage of these checkpoints to switch T cells off. This keeps the cancer cells from being killed. Immune checkpoint inhibitors are drugs that block the checkpoints. This frees the T cells to attack the cancer. Immune checkpoint inhibitors are an effective way to treat some types of cancer, but they don't work for every patient and can cause serious side effects. To learn more about immunotherapy, visit cancer.gov slash immunotherapy or call 1-800-4-CANCER. U.S. So <clears throat> that's in a nutshell. I mean, basically the cancer cell has a way of switching off your immune system and these modern medications that we use can be used to reactivate the immune system to attack your tumor. And it's a very exciting development. So those drugs that they were talking about in that slide only include this one pathway here and another pathway down here involving the T cell receptor and this pathway. But as you can see, there's more than a dozen of these uh, on the T cell, which uh, control either 
increase the immune response or decrease the immune response. And many of these now are uh, being used to try to develop new reagents, which can regulate this key cell that helps fight cancer called the T cell. So very exciting. I'm sorry about this. So this is just a diagram. We'll skip over this because I don't think this is helpful. Uh, but that's another uh, diagram showing the myriad of control mechanisms on the T cell, all of which we are working on in terms of finding new drugs can, can either upregulate and activate the T cell or tone it down. Uh, and this is a very exciting development. We're just at the very beginning of this because we only have drugs now that are in use that attack one or two of these uh, signaling molecules on the T cell. So this is uh, just how do we decide which patients are going to respond, patients that produce more of a protein called PDL1, as because one of the common uh, pathways that we in use new drugs on is that PDL1 pathway. So the more of that PDL1 present on the tumor cell, then the better those drugs work. And the amount of mutations in the tumor is another marker. And so that's shown here that if you have a lot of PDL1, you tend to respond better. And that's what this graph is showing you. You have more response to the immune therapy if you have a lot of PDL1 on your tumor than if you have a very little or none at all. And this is just a slide showing that the more mutations you have, the more chance of response. So this notion of having a tumor that's inflamed is very important because inflamed tumors often have high PDL1, very high mutation burden, and those really tend to respond to immune therapies. But these kinds of current immune therapies are limited. It only works in about 50% of lung cancers doesn't work in breast or colon, and uh, often has to be administered many times uh, every few weeks for years to maintain those responses. A newer version is called CAR-T therapy, uh, which has just started to come into its own. And we know a, a doctor named Carl June at the University of Pennsylvania, who has been a leader in this field and has done the seminal work proving that this can help to cure, fight and cure advanced cancers. And here's a list of six drugs, which are CAR T therapies, these sort of uh, armored T cells that will fight your tumor. Uh, these are already FDA approved. And as you can see on the right side of this, they're almost all in leukemias and lymphomas. But we're hopeful that in the future, we'll be able to use these drugs for patients with uh, solid tumors. Now, I'm not going to show this in the interests of time, but there's a lot of interesting educational videos. So to wrap up, I think we just gave you a really just a tasting menu of some of the background and some of the newer treatments used to fight cancer. Future directions, as I mentioned, there's a number of other immune checkpoints on that graph. I showed you more than a dozen in which we're developing therapies that we hopefully will be able to use in the future. And using these CAR T or these cells, which can stay in your body and don't need to be administered again and again as sort of a, a bulk work against other kinds of tumors. So we're working on it in lung cancer and breast cancer and many other kinds of cancers. And we have a very active cellular program at uh, AHN at the West Penn Hospital, where we're employing the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and these uh, engineered T cells to fight cancer. So we'll skip over sort of this future directions in the interest of time, but in reducing your cancer risk, you know, you have to try to Avoid tobacco, that in particular is a very common cause of many different kinds of cancers. Limit your alcohol use, wear sunscreen, eat lots of fruits and vegetables, and try to maintain a healthy weight and healthy diet and get regular medical care. 
And with that, I'm going to stop. And I'm sorry I went a little long. Uh, I went about 40 minutes. So thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. You were perfect, Dr. Finley. Thank you so much for that informative talk. We do have a couple questions in the um, chat. Let me see if I can relay them to you. Uh, a question, why is it not commonplace to test advanced lung cancer for brain mets? My deceased husband went through radiation. It was down to a small lymph node involvement. Then we were told he had brain mets, had 12 weeks after that. Why isn't it normal um, that brain mets are, aren't screened? That's right. Um, <clears throat> well, this is has to do with the fact that in, I don't know in this particular case, but generally in patients with stage three or stage four lung cancer, we do test and do brain MRIs to look for signs of spread to the brain. <clears throat> if we established that there are no brain metastases, uh, then you know we generally don't do brain MRIs all the time unless there are headache or other symptoms associated uh, with brain metastases. But we do do screening for brain metastases during the staging of lung cancer, especially uh, if we're going to operate on them or if it's stage three or stage four. Thanks, Dr. Finley. We have another comment. Um, uh, a, a participant is asking if the slides will be available. Yes, we'll tell you how to get the a recording of this session. It will be on our AHN YouTube. YouTube channel, and we will go over that detail at the end of this session. Um, there's a couple more. Um, uh, how do we as patients enter into a conversation about treatment goals with our oncologist? Then he, thanks for your compassion, intelligence, and life's work. You are greatly appreciated. Yeah, I mean, the this notion of so when I started out in this field, <clears throat> the doctor would go in and you would basically tell the patient what you were going to do and what was expected. But we weren't really at that time focused so much on what the patient was feeling and how they felt about various treatments, how they felt about having cancer. And we didn't really focus so much on the shared decision making where we are now. Uh, we've come a long way, and we realize now that even with all the newer treatments, we have to be aware that cancer it can be a, a life-limiting illness, and we have to plan for all of the, the events through the cancer journey. So I think uh, having shared decision-making up front, finding out what the patient's goals are for their treatment is critical, and it's something that's really much more important now. It's always been important, but there's been a big emphasis on it. And the way that we're practicing now is a lot different than the way we were practicing 30 years ago. Um, we have a comment. Excellent presentation, Dr. Finley. We love having you at the Katanning office. Um, being there, the bunch of nice people there. It's a great resource for Armstrong County. Great. And another question, is frequent blood work valuable for early cancer detection? If so, why don't PCPs order more frequent blood work for middle-aged patients? Right. Well, that's a good question. And that's, um, I've had this conversation with my wife, but the traditional blood tests that we order, like blood counts and things like that, they're fine. And they can indicate that maybe there's something brewing. If you're anemic, maybe you're having a a tumor in your colon and losing blood and so forth. But the more recent technologies are looking at <clears throat> uh, markers in the blood that represent cancer. So the cancer cells themselves um, release their contents into the bloodstream, just like all of our cells do. But because cancer cells have key mutations in them that your normal cells don't, you can find cancer-related DNA in the blood, even in patients with very early stage disease. And there's been a, a very uh, a lot of interest and a lot of young companies 
have arisen to take advantage of that. And there are developing screening, broad screening tests for the most common kinds of cancers. Uh, there's a company called Grail, which is based in uh, uh, Boston, I believe, and in San Diego, that is doing just that. They don't have FDA approval, but for $900, you can have a, a blood test that will screen you for uh, you know 15 or 20 different kinds of cancers. But this is just the very tip of the iceberg with this technology. So eventually, we will have much more reliable blood-based screening tests for all forms of cancer we have now. And so that's also uh, uh, going to be very helpful in finding cancers at an earlier stage when they're the most curable. <laughs> okay, here's one more question, Dr. Finley. Have you found that COVID has increased lung cancer diagnosis? Well, I wouldn't say that it's increased lung cancer diagnosis, but what it for sure has done is that patients during the COVID pandemic didn't go to the doctor. So we have seen a big uptake in more advanced cancers when uh, the pandemic died down a bit. And so we're finding cancers at later stage, and this has happened over the last two or three years, and it's been very prominent. It's been no noted not only in the US, but worldwide. The other thing about COVID is that it does tend to perturb your immune system. And there have been notable cases of patients who had cancer, including the case of a famous French immunologist who <clears throat> he didn't have a COVID infection, but when he had a COVID vaccine, um, the cancer came back in the lymph node under the same arm where he had the, the, the shot. So COVID does have some interesting and uh, profound effects on the immune system. And we've certainly seen uh, immune related uh, problems from COVID for sure. But I can't say that we've had an uptick in overall cancer rates related to COVID. Uh, that I, I will remain to be seen. Okay, well, you know, I, I think that's all the questions that we had in the chat. We really appreciate the interactive discussion that we've had tonight. Um, I can turn this back over to Tanya to close us out. Thank you so much, Dr. Finley. Oh, you're welcome. That was very fun. Um, I hope you can see my screen with the, with the resources. Um, if there are no other questions, um, we would like to thank all of you for attending our Ahead of Cancer lecture this evening, the first one for 2024. Please continue to join us at our monthly Ahead of Cancer lecture series as we focus on cancer screening, early detection, treatment, and survivorship. As a reminder, tonight's lecture was recorded. If you are interested in rewatching tonight's lecture, check back on the AHN YouTube channel, www.youtube.com forward slash Allegheny Health Network for the full recording in about a week. This video, as well as all other past lectures, will be posted under the Ahead of Cancer playlist. If you would like to schedule an appointment or have questions regarding a potential cancer concern, please call the HOPE line at 412-578-4673 to schedule an appointment. You may also call our 24-hour nurse for you line at 412-687-4968. Thank you, Dr. Finley, for the great presentation, and thanks to all who attended the lecture this evening. Have a great evening, everyone. <laughs>